Hello and welcome to the Building Transformations interview series. I'm Tom Strong, President and CEO of Building Transformations and Principal at Wired Dock Construction. Uh, this interview series is really focused on uh, interviewing leaders from across the industry that look after technology and innovation for their uh, organizations. We talk about trends, we talk about career, we talk about the intersection between culture, tools and processes. Uh, today, we've got a really interesting conversation with one of our new board members, Alice Lung. Uh, she is the Vice President of Product and Platform at Brick and Mortar, which is a venture capitalist firm out of San Francisco. Super excited to have her on our board. She's got amazing insight into the in industry and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Alice uh, from Brick and Mortar. Uh, Alice has recently joined our board of directors here at Building Transformations, which we're, we're super uh, stoked about. Uh, Alice, if you have never uh, met Alice or heard her speak, she's she's uh, definitely an influential person uh, who's uh, spoken at many events uh, across North America. Uh, she's uh, vice president at Bricks and Brick and Mortar, and um, Alice is joining us from San Francisco. Welcome, Alice. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me on as part of the series. I'm excited to speak with you today. Awesome. So uh, how's the weather there in uh, San Francisco today? Is it starting to warm up or is the, is the fog clearing? It is deceiving. It looks sunny outside, but it's actually pretty cold. So I would say pretty, pretty normal weather for us here in San Francisco. Right on. Um, so, yeah, we're super excited that you've joined our board. Um, and uh, we kind of look forward to your contribution. I mean, you obviously have a really like a you know deep perspective on the market. You've been uh, wor you've worked in the industry for a long time. You worked at DPR Construction. Now you're at brick and mortar doing investments. You're connected with all these startups and the tech scene. So um, maybe you can just give us a, a bit of a rundown on your career path and yourself and uh, brick and mortar. Yeah, awesome. Um, so like Tom mentioned, uh, I used to work at Brick and Mortar Ventures, started off my career as a project engineer working on large hospital projects. Uh, so was very much out on the construction sites, managing scopes of work. Early in my career got pulled into managing 3D model coordination. So that kind of got me involved with the world of BIM VDC, uh, works really closely with the innovation group at DPR in evaluating and implementing new tech. Uh, so I worked on two large hospitals here in the Bay Area, then relocated to Singapore to help start up the Southeast Asia headquarters for DPR, where I worked mostly on data center projects and did some consulting work for clients around bim for fm and some of the um, adaptation of new technologies. Uh, while in Singapore, I actually got to learn a lot about the Southeast Asia market from a construction perspective as well as a tech adoption perspective. So I saw that there was a lot of appetite for technology adoption, but just given some of the differences in um, you know, labor costs and the uh, emphasis in you know, adopting different types of new technologies, um, I saw that the forefront of technology adoption was still back here in the US. So I relocated back here to the Bay Area, uh, worked on another project with DPR and ultimately got the opportunity to join the brick and mortar ventures team Sorry, <laughs> my cat. Um, and now what I do is uh, invest in early stage construction technology startups. Um, we kind of define construction tech as um, the construction process. So that starts with design that goes through pre-construction, construction, handover commissioning and operations and maintenance. And we invest across all market verticals. Um, so from single family residential to commercial real estate, to oil and gas, mining, civil infrastructure. And I kind of define us as sitting in between prop tech and industrial because we do look at both of those kind of sectors, um, but focus on really investing in the technologies that uh, help the construction pro process become more efficient and, and really digging into um, the productivity aspect of construction. Yeah, right on. I, but I mean, I'm, my perspective has always been more Canadian. But um, you know, we've done what well, the company I used to be at did some JVs with DPR. I was very, always very impressed with DPR as, a, as an organization. 
Uh, and you were there for a number of years, I think like six years. Did you start in the BDC group there or did you, were you working somewhere else and then wanted to get into, into that because there was more technology focused? Yeah, so I actually didn't start in the VDC group. Um, my first internship did happen to be in VDC, though when I joined DPR full time, um, I was very much in the operations route. And it's it's interesting that you bring that up because I think this is actually something that a lot of people from industry think and talk about is, you know, do you go down that operations route or do you think about, you know, joining a company and focusing on the BIM and VDC side? Um, for me, I, I took the route down operations because I felt like in order for us to do BIM properly and to adopt and implement the best technologies, I really wanted to make sure that I had a really good foundation of all the processes out on a construction site. Um, so that's why I kind of had that emphasis more on the operations side. Um, but because of that one internship that I did, I really got to dig deep into BIM, all the processes, coordination um, on a pretty innovative project that was, you know, kind of based around a lot of the IP, IPD principles. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very collaborative. There's a big room and all that. So I took a lot of that experience um, and took it with me across, you know, all the different projects and roles that I've worked on and and i think um that has really helped me in kind of empathizing with a lot of the yeah. folks that work in bim and vdc but also just being able to gain the experience around cost scheduling um change control and all that type of stuff like i think when we think about bim it really does need to be connected with all of these different processes out on site um so that's that's a little bit on kind of like my career path and why i chose yeah. to go down that path um, but I know now there's a lot more career opportunities and paths focusing on BIM, VDC and te technology, uh, which is very different from when I was in industry. It was, you know, it, it almost felt like a lot of the BIM engineers and the BIM managers um, went down this career path that didn't really have anywhere else to go. But I think the industry now today, um, there are just so many different paths for people to go down. Yeah. Well, it's a very, I mean, it's a very um, interesting subject. Uh, in my formal life, I ran a huge group of like, there's a hundred people or more that were focused on BDC and we'd bring them in. And I was, my mandate was sort of like, get this initiative across the whole business. And my thought was uh, the best, the use of BIM or VDC technology has to be operations. So the thought was, we got to get the skills into the coordinators on the job sites and they need to be the ones accountable to manage the job. Uh, to, to to coordinate a project effectively, you need to manage people and communicate with people. You need to understand the moving parts, uh, the politics, the changes, the costs uh, on an ongoing basis on on the ground level. And, you know, the technology should be seen as a tool that you use um, to build. And it shouldn't be seen as sort of something separate and independent of the actual construction process. So, you know, I agree 100 percent. You know, the the use of BIM now, I think it's evolving now where people are recognizing like this is this is a skill and a capability that if you're operating in the industry, you need to be able to like navigate a 3D model uh, and digest that information the same as like reading a schedule or reading blueprints. It should just be like part of how you operate, how you think. And culturally, I think we did have that kind of split where you could go down this sort of like technology path as a career or you can go down the operations side. And I, I think the industry needs to kind of see these things as the same thing as we kind of up the skills of our, everyone in the industry. Um, and it's, it's a huge, it's an interesting subject. Um, so yeah, so you obviously had a passion for the construction side. You obviously had a passion for the te te technology side. How did you land at brick and mortar? Yeah, so it was a very interesting journey. Um, so I kind of got to a point in my career where you know, I was really interested in getting involved with a lot of the startups. And, and this was really me moving back to the Bay Area from Singapore. I kind of felt like during my two and a half years abroad, I kind of lost touch with um, really just being involved with that start tech construction technology startup ecosystem. Uh, so that's when I like really tried to get, you know, re-engaged back into the community, started talking to some of the startups. And, um, and it got to a point where I kind of felt like, you know, I had worked on all of these construction projects and I loved um, creating all of these new processes and helping implement new processes and combining technology with operations. But I saw that for me to have an impact on um, the industry as a whole on a bigger scale, 
I thought that working for a construction technology startup would actually give me an opportunity to have bigger impact rather than um, going from project to project and really getting into those nitty gritty details. Uh, so that was when I decided to yeah, reach out to a lot more construction tech startups, was looking at the overall landscape. And uh, I got reconnected with Curtis Rogers, who's one of the partners here at Brick and Mortar. And I met him at an innovation conference many, many years ago. It was, it was at the beginning of my career. And back in the day, the construction technology startup ecosystem was so small. And we were both kind of connected to the same startup. So that startup connected us. And I had kind of followed along uh, his journey and brick and mortar's journey and knew that he was working with a lot of different startups. So I kind of reached out to him, um, hoping to get connected with more startups that you know brick and mortar ventures was was speaking with and interested in and through those conversations i ended up getting an opportunity to join brick and mortar so it was very uh i had no idea what venture capital was um and i was not kind of looking for a job at brick and mortar ventures um but i think the timing just ended up being right and they were looking for someone with my skill set having worked overseas in southeast asia as well as uh the emphasis on bim and vdc mm -hmm. and very much you know coming from the end user perspective so i ended up getting a job offer um about three years ago and uh haven't looked back yeah well it's like it's a super cool position i mean you you probably are talking to many startups every day or kind of bringing uh, new innovative products to market that can really affect change. So it's got to be interesting just every day to, to interact with that, the, that sort of an enthusiastic entrepreneurial spirit and being able to like on the sort of cutting edge and evaluating what's coming and seeing how that's going to affect the market. Uh, I'm curious about your title, like you're the vice president of platform and, and product strategy. Is that right? So what what does that mean? Like what is in that role? What are your responsibilities? Yeah, so uh, I am on the investment committee, so I am investing and evaluating startups. But um, during some of my conversations with Darren, I, I mentioned to him that I actually wanted to have a bigger role in operations. So I wanted to um, put on kind of you know, more events for our portfolio companies, wanted to solidify, you know, a lot of the processes around working with the greater network um, in the construction industry and just doing a lot more, I guess, um, networking and relationship building with not just the startups, but everyone else that's that's around to, to support those startups. Um, so that kind of leads to uh, our new initiative at Brick and Mortar Ventures, which is former Glab. So we've partnered with Built Worlds uh, to put on the first accelerator program focused on construction. So it's it's very much a role where I kind of get to work a lot more closely with industry rather than just doing the investing side and only speaking with startups. Yeah, well, it's I mean, it's, it's a super important function, I think, that VCs play uh, in helping new companies bring these products to market and you're, you're building and maintaining this ecosystem which ultimately is, is emerging to address the challenges that we face in our industry. Uh, from your perspective, you know, you're, you're in San Francisco, you have a really good purview of the American market as well as um, uh, international. What, what are the big challenges that the industry is facing and, and what do you, where do you see uh, investment dollars going and what are the sort of products that you're super excited about or sort of categories of products that are emerging? Yeah, if I look at the, I would say maybe North America market. Um, the biggest feedback that we're getting from industry is the labor shortage. Uh, we haven't really, you know, done the full research on globally construction whether or not there is a labor shortage. My guess in a lot of the industries where there is still a lot of importing of foreign labor uh, for construction that may not be as big of an issue. Definitely here in the U.S., labor shortage. I would say if I think about construction globally. The biggest challenge is still um, the way that construction is set up. We we need a lot of collaboration tools. Um, and I think that kind of ties back to not only BIM and VDC, but also on the project management side and a lot of these um, you know, legacy technologies that are just not very collaborative and and there just aren't you know, open APIs and integrations and all that type of stuff. So I would say, yeah, as a whole, um, the biggest challenge is kind of the I guess just challenges in collaboration in general and whether it's a technology thing or a contractual thing that we need to solve. I think those are all things that we need to think about is like, how do we just make it easier for us to work together and build these projects? Because a lot of construction uh, has, you know, 
50 plus companies all coming together to build one project. And on those even larger projects, they, they're going to be upwards of 200 different companies all coming together to build, you know, whether it's an airport or whatever it is. Um, the challenges within managing all of those documents, the information, collaboration, data, what do you share, what do you not share? Um, that's a big challenge that hasn't been solved yet. And we're seeing technologies tackle bits and pieces of this, um, but we kind of need this, you know, greater, I guess, uh, emphasis on, you know, interoperability and integrations. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I always kind of thought that the root cause of this is that there's a, a lack of emphasis on control uh, of intellectual property. Like, uh, you know, if you look at the automotive industry as an example, like Toyota or Honda, they obviously main, they develop, they design, they engineer their product and they maintain that intellectual uh, property. And they also maintain all the intellectual property to, you know, fabricate it and manage the supply chain that's connected to it. And it's all hinged to um, that the repeatability of the product um, that they control. Whereas our, in our industry, you know, construction, we mobilize to build something that we'll never build again. We'll build it once, we'll never build it again. And there's very few repeatable processes that we can build upon and improve upon uh, as we sort of develop the fabrication or, or, um, or supply chain connections. Uh, that's, to me, that's one of the biggest opportunities to improve our, our overall approach is just, you know, rethink that whole, the relationship between the, the, the companies that de uh, develop the intellectual property, the design engineering firms, and the builders who are actually like actualizing how to do it. But what are your thoughts on that? I 100% agree. Um, so we've seen the trend, and this is probably in the last two to three years, there's been a lot of startups um, getting into the prefab or modular space. So I think there's a lot of people thinking about, you know, how do we build homes like products? So we have an investment in a company called Connect Homes, and um, they are trying to build, you know, single family residential like a product. And it's their whole process is very similar to a car where, you know, the chassis is basically the same, right? So you have a couple of different models of what that home structure would look like. Um, and the customization is really just in the finishes. So that allows for, you know, productivity in, in manufacturing in the factory um, as you're limiting design, you know, it, it, but it still allows for the homeowners to have a level, level of customization that makes it feel like home. Um, so we've, We've looked at that trend for a really long time. And I think, you know, frankly, prefab modular it works for certain types of construction, but it doesn't work for all types of construction, at least with the technologies today. And the newest trend is we're starting to see uh, startups trying to build almost this like software layer to control robotics in a way that can be a little more scalable and allows you to have more flexibility in design. So you're, you know, pr programming KUKA robots, robotic arms to basically like draw out or install or build what, you know, what could be seen as, you know, bespoke wall panels. Um, so I think there's some really interesting stuff there. Um, but I think, you know, we're still kind of a bit far away from the industry kind of looking like that as a whole. And I think for a lot of the construction projects that may not have the ability to do prefab and modular, there are other things that we can adopt from manufacturing in general and the way that we think about the supply chain. And if there is a way for us to structure labor and materials or procure it in a different way and set up those contracts in a different way where we can really have specialized labor uh, as it relates to specific tasks, perform those tasks with, you know, different, you know, labor cost structures and all that type of stuff. So there's, there's a ton of opportunity. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from manufacturing, whether it's automotive or oil and gas, EPC. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can take that has been done in those industries to bring into construction. I read uh, just the headline recently about uh, a project in China where they, they intend to completely uh, 3D print a hydroelectric uh, damn, I don't know if you saw that headline or read that article, but um, that's a pretty interesting challenge, like a moonshot that they've established, which will require them to develop a whole bunch of like, you know, specific solutions to be able to to, to build that. And I know we've talked in the past a little bit about uh, you know, robotics on job sites and, you know, uh, really how the, so the next wave of companies and growth and entrepreneurs and startups will probably be 
uh, products and systems um, and, and mechani mechanization of systems focus on uh, making skilled labor on the job site more efficient or augmenting their work. Um, maybe you can like elaborate a little bit on that. Like, what are your thoughts around where robotics is going for construction? Do you see that as like a huge sector that's opening up right now? Like, are we on the edge edge of seeing more systems uh, for job sites? Yeah, so construction robotics is still very new. I would say the one of the like later stage construction robotics companies is Canvas that had raised a series B. So in terms of like maturity of the overall space, it's still very new. Um, Dusty Robotics also recently raised a series B. We invested in Rugged Robotics. I was in the series A. So it's still very much in the like early stages in terms of um, construction technology maturity. Um, but at the same time, you know, one of the reasons why I think that construction robotics is timing is now is because of, you know, the ability for us to uh, iterate on robotics has become quicker and quicker, faster and faster. Um, the parts are being a lot are, are a lot less expensive. A lot of these sensors have actually, you know, gone through a ton of R&D in the massive amounts of funding into self-driving cars. So we're now able to utilize a lot of those sensors and technologies into construction robotics on a job site. Um, so the, the the job site is not an easy environment, um, but just kind of given a lot of the R&D happening in, that has happened in robotics and adjacent industries, now is really the, the time when it's not that expensive to start a construction robotics company. It's not that expensive to build up some prototypes that actually work and you could start doing pilot projects and stuff like that. Um, so I would love to see a lot more uh, entrepreneurs and you don't need to be from industry, um, but I want to see a lot more entrepreneurs kind of tapping into all of the robotic development that has happened in adjacent industries, bringing that into construction. Um, and there's still so many different use cases out there that can be tackled with robotics. I mean, the, 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 I guess the main thing that people say is like, you want to use robots for the dull, dirty, dangerous. Uh, most of construction is dull, dirty, dangerous. Um, so yeah, we're, I've, I've seen a couple more startups um, tackling like X to your skin. There was a startup that was looking at concrete finishing. Um, so we need more of these. And, and if you look at each of those scopes of work, they're almost, you know, multi-billion dollar industries in themselves. So there are a lot of opportunities for, you know, unicorn valuation construction robotics companies. Um, so I'm really excited about the space, but of course I'm biased because I've always said that construction is a physical process. Uh, so we require physical things to build things in our real world. Yeah, right on. Uh, I wanted to ask you before we wrap up here, but kind of a big subject, but what, what do you think the relationship between these big technology companies that are emerging uh, that the whole industry is becoming more and more reliant on and the sort of incumbent general contractors and builders that are kind of relying on these systems and, and sort of adjusting their business processes to, to operate on top of those systems that they don't control, that they just buy. Um, how do you think that relationship will unfold in the future? Do you think general contractors are going to be disintermediated? Do you think the, these big technology companies pose a threat to uh, the builders who rely on those systems? Do you think that there's a, sort of like, um, you know, a, sort of like a, a tension that's playing out or what's your perspective on this? I definitely get a sense that there is some tension playing out. Um, so a lot of these, you know, old established players, technology players that have been around for a really long time, um, we can now add <clears throat> Procore to that mix. So Autodesk, Bentley, Procore, a lot of these guys that have been around for a really long time um, are very important tools, right? They're, they're providing a very important service to our industry. Um, but at the same time, the tech has been built, you know, 20, 30 plus years ago. And we repeatedly hear from the industry that the complexities and in integrations and the lack of ability to pull data in and out of these really old systems to collaborate better with a lot of these new technologies is a really big frustration. Um, so I think with this new wave of construction technology startups, they are being built on today's software architectures. They're being built, you know, utilizing tools that make it really easy to continue to iterate. Um, I would love to see, 
you know, the ability for a lot of these uh, construction tech startups to collaborate with each other and almost kind of recreate a technology ecosystem where it may not necessarily be, you know, one player that owns market share, um, but, you know, a more kind of democratized way for uh, construction companies to utilize technology in a fair kind of way um, that, you know, isn't, doesn't, isn't seen as super expensive um, and the ability to kind of freely transfer data from software to software or be able to, you know, take that data and use it however, that, however way that they want. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity and new, new technologies in this space. Um, but if, if, if the big uh, players, you know, start opening up, you know, their systems and, and are building APIs and stuff like that, I think that'll make it for an easier kind of transition. And I think, a, and, and I think a lot of construction companies can get a lot more value out of the large companies if they do that. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an interesting uh, subject. And I, I kind of think the, the biggest threat to those incumbent players isn't, I mean, there's a whole flurry of startups that are emerging that sort of are, are best in class and provide a lot of like, you know, uh, new capability in different areas. But I, I think the bigger threat to those uh, incumbent players are like low code or no code systems where you can kind of quickly develop your own uh, systems using sort of an off the shelf um, architecture that is, uh, you know, doesn't require a lot of skills to, to build out. I think as that stuff becomes more popular and there's more skills um, with the younger people coming into the market that can kind of build out their own system, I think that's a bigger threat to, to sort of getting off um, a system that you know costs a lot of money to build and maintain, but costs a lot of money to buy. Um, anyways, Alice, we could talk probably for a long time. There's a lot of other things I wanted to chat with you about, but I do really appreciate your time. Um, how can we learn more about uh, bricks and mortar, or brick and mortar, I should say, sorry, and uh, and the investments that you're making? Yeah, so you can uh, find us on LinkedIn or you can come to our website, brickmortar.vc. Uh, if there are any entrepreneurs out there that are not from construction and want to learn about the space, please feel free to reach out. If you're an AEC industry professional interested in starting a company that is in the construction tech space, whether or not it's venture backed or not, um, I would still be more than happy to chat with you and, and provide any type of support that we can. I think, you know, us being, uh, so brick and mortar ventures being kind of, you know, from industry, our investors are from industry, um, our team is from industry. I kind of see us as the by construction for construction venture capital firm. And we are more than happy to help out anyone who wants to do anything in technology and construction, whether or not it is a fit for an investment for our fund. Um, so that's uh, something that we'd love to do, whether you know you want to get connected with um, you know industry professionals to get feedback or to get connected with large companies for pilot jobs. Um, I, I want you guys to see us as the resource for anything construction tech related. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I think you're doing amazing work. And I think it's a really important function that you're playing in the industry to you know, be a VC that is focused on our industry and support this uh, this community, this ecosystem of startups. And uh, welcome to the board and, and thank you for your contribution. Thanks, Tom. It's an honor for me to be able to participate. Okay, we'll talk soon. Thanks. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, Building Transformations is a non-for-profit. We're focused on uh, delivering new technologies and innovations to ultimately improve our civilization. Uh, this organization is extremely busy. Uh, we have a number of different programs that we're managing every day, uh, and we would love to have your participation. So please go over to cambim.com or, or buildingtransformations.org uh, to get involved. You can check out everything that we're doing. Uh, of course, tune in for our next, uh, next events. We have a very active uh, and busy schedule for the next 12 months. Uh, I also want to thank all of our supporting partners, and we have many of them uh, that make this possible. We can't do this without you, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, and I just want to encourage everyone, of course, to uh, subscribe, like, follow, share uh, this content. We'd love to have you subscribing on YouTube. So uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. And that way, every time we publish content, you're going to get it. Uh, so thank you very much. Building Transformations is a CanBIM production hosted by me, Thomas Strong. Produced by Jerry Latman. Visual and graphic effects by Allison Burgess. Scripting by Joseph Watson. Post-production supervision by Sergey Greshko, editing by Theodore Bazaire, and visual effects and editing by Musafar Malik.